It's time for munching. And mating. In the Macrocystis or Giant Kelp. With your host, Dr. Bill Bushing. One of the best things about my job is that when I go to the office, I don't have to wear a tie with my suit. Wetsuit, that is. By the time I started diving California waters in the late 1960s, the giant sea bass was largely absent from our region. In fact, I didn't see my first one until the very late 1990s. Now I see them frequently each summer and fall. This is the story of these magnificent fish and their slow climb back from regional extinction. The giant sea bass was originally known as either the Jewfish or the black sea bass in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Several large groupers in other parts of the United States were also called Jewfish until that name was discontinued due to the religious connotations. The name black sea bass was changed to giant sea bass by the American Fisheries Society about 1961 because the former common name was already used for an unrelated fish on the East Coast. The scientific name, Stereolepis gigas, comes from the Greek for firm-scaled giant. It was given to this fish in 1809 by heirs who first described it scientifically. The giant sea bass was originally placed in the grouper family, Serranidae, but later moved into a new family, the temperate basses, Persichthyidae. However, its proper taxonomic position has never been fully resolved. Similarities between the larval forms of the giant sea bass and the wreckfish in the family Polyprionidae appear to support its placement with them. Historically, the giant sea bass has been reported from Humboldt Bay in Northern California south to Cabo San Lucas at the tip of Baja, California, and throughout the Gulf of California, also known as the Sea of Cortez. These fish were so common near Avalon on Santa Catalina Island that Jewfish Point was named after them. In these historic photos from Catalina's museum, you can see that they were the target of early anglers. Boats even flew giant sea bass flags when they were brought in. Giant sea bass juveniles and adults are mainly bottom dwellers. They prefer rocky reefs, kelp forests, and sand or mud flats, but are occasionally seen in open water as well. They are most commonly found over rocky bottom habitats, next to giant kelp beds, and on the edge of rocky reefs. Depths may range from 30 feet to at least 300 feet. And they often prefer areas where the bottom drops off fairly quickly into deeper water. These fish can be found well away from the reefs if searching for food in midwater or foraging over soft bottoms for squid and other food. Giant sea bass will remain at a reef even if the kelp beds disappear over time. This can happen due to severe overgrazing by sea urchins or warm water events like an El Nino. Hey, get out of the picture, small fry! Fry! Yikes! Early on, these fish were referred to as black sea bass due to the color of individuals brought back to shore for weighing and photographs. It was believed that the juvenile fish were spotted, but the mature fish were dark. It is now known that the dark color was due in large part to the fact they were dead. Divers encountering live fish underwater have observed several color variations. Giant sea bass can appear a very uniform light gray, various shades of gray with large dark spots, or a pattern exhibited by many other fish where they are light in color on the lower or ventral side and darker on the dorsal. 
This is believed to provide camouflage from predators looking down towards the dark bottom or up towards the lighter sky and surface waters. Individual giant sea bass are capable of changing their color pattern. It is thought these color changes are a form of communication between fish and or a response to stress. Giant sea bass have the usual complement of fins. There is a single, strongly notched dorsal fin with two parts. The spiny forward section is low and often retracted into a groove on the fish's back. Unlike the spiny first dorsal, the second fleshy dorsal is higher, shorter in length, and not retractable. The bass's pectoral fins, located on either side of the body, are very important while hovering. They may also be used to break as the fish comes to a stop, but are held close to the body while swimming for streamlining. The pectorals may also be held out to stabilize the fish or to turn. Fins on the lower part of the body include the paired ventral or pelvic fins below the pectoral fins and the single anal fin just below the caudal peduncle or base of the tail. The giant sea bass's powerful tail or caudal fin provides propulsion when the fish is swimming thanks to strong muscles at its base and along the flanks of the fish. This fin allows quick bursts of speed to escape from danger. At slower speeds, back and forth movement of the head indicates the tail fin is in use. The combined action of these fins allows the giant sea bass to maneuver fairly well given its large size. The fish's head is dominated by the huge mouth. As in other fish, the mouth is used for respiration as well as for feeding. It opens and closes, drawing water into the mouth cavity and passing it over the gills where oxygen is transferred to the fish's circulatory system before it exits through the gill cover or operculum, carrying with it carbon dioxide and other wastes. Although very large, the mouth contains only small teeth mostly located at the rear. These fish feed by quickly opening their mouths, creating a vacuum which draws fish and other prey in. They are therefore referred to as suction feeders. Here you see a bass take prey off the bottom as I filmed from a small submarine. These bass are exhibiting behavior that appears to be related to possible feeding activity. Usually, these fish feed at night. Because of their protected status today, it is not possible to analyze the stomach contents of live fish. Much earlier, state marine biologist John Fitch was able to inspect the stomach contents of a number of giant sea bass and gave us some useful information about their dietary preferences. The bass's diet is reported to include abalone, octopus, squid, lobster, most likely at night, mantis shrimp, bait fish like sardines and jack mackerel, especially by the young bass, 
bottom fish like CO sole and halibut, ocean whitefish, sheephead, midwater fish including blacksmith and sargo, guitar fish and small sharks like this horn shark, bat rays are apparently a delicacy although this bass must be full and they add an occasional kelp or barred sand bass for variety. Reports that they can outswim and eat bonita are probably false. Now we all know from Newton's law of gravity that what goes up must come down. However, were you aware that you and other creatures are what you eat minus what you excrete? I have learned that individual bass may defecate on bothersome divers like myself, which also provides other fish with a rather questionable meal. This giant sea bass is somewhat unusual. Notice how clean its head region is. There are very few obvious parasites on it. Unlike this individual, which has a large complement of them. Even casual observation of giant sea bass quickly reveals that they are usually covered with parasites, especially near the head region. Most of the parasites seen on these gentle giants are copepods, also referred to as sea lice. According to Dr. Milton Love, the parasitic copepods that attach to fish are often from two related groups, the genus Lepiopterus or Caligus. Hobson identified the ones that dominate the giant sea bass as Lepiopterus longipes. Here you see a male and a female of the closely related salmon sea louse. The long white strands on the female are egg sacs. Off Catalina's leeward coast, these parasites are often cleaned from the bass by young sheephead. Fixed cleaning stations are more prominent in the tropics, where many fish species visit them to have cleaner fish and invertebrates like shrimp remove parasites and diseased or dead tissue. Here in the temperate waters of the kelp forest, I see a lot of cleaning behavior, but it is generally not at fixed locations. Senorita, rock wrasse, and other cleaning fish can be observed doing their work mid-water or just over the bottom. One possibility was to take advantage of food scraps when the bass feed. Another option is linked to the behavior of the cleaning fish. Based on my observations, cleaners focus much of their effort along the fins and body of the fish. The sheephead will clean bass over most parts of their body. They often focus on the base of the fins, the sides, and the ventral surfaces. However, they generally avoid cleaning the head region, at least close to the mouth, where they might become dinner instead of cleaners. This may explain why the parasites are so common there. Here, one sheephead chases another away from the bass. Which occasionally has to break up these fights. Other common cleaners associated with the giant sea bass include the senorita, and the island kelpfish, which is a primary cleaner off Anacapa Island. I have even seen kelp bass appear to clean them, although they seem much more cautious.
Off Anacapa Island to the north, fixed cleaning stations have been identified, perhaps because the primary cleaner fish involved, the island kelpfish, is more strongly reef associated. From the behavior filmed here, you can see the giant sea bass also rub their bodies against algae, kelp, and the bottom, apparently to remove parasites if cleaners aren't present. One interesting interaction that I have observed several times is when schools of jack mackerel follow a swimming bass. At first I thought they were just slipstreaming to save energy. Until I filmed them close up and realized they were rubbing their bodies on the rough, scaly sides of the bass. I have seen similar behavior between jack mackerel and soup fin sharks off Catalina. This behavior may serve to rub parasites off the mackerel thanks to the rough skin of the bass and the sharks. Often giant sea bass are seen hovering over the bottom during the day since much of their activity is nocturnal. Even well-trained DIR divers could learn something about buoyancy control from these magnificent fish. Giant sea bass themselves are likely eaten by a variety of fish and marine mammals when they are small. But as they grow large, only man and large sharks can eat them. I believe their daytime behavior of hovering mostly near the bottom may also be a defense against attacks by great whites or other large predators. Great whites are known to attack from below and there just isn't a lot of maneuvering room to do so if the bass is hovering a few feet off the bottom. Until great whites learn to bury in the sands and attack from there the bass, and I, should be safe. Hovering may also be a way of avoiding strong currents and minimizing energy expenditure. The following sequences show some interesting behavior I have observed. Note that these bass appear to lean over while swimming and hovering. In addition, movements of the mouth are common including the yawn which probably serves to back flush the gills. I was lucky enough to capture this one up close and personal.
The yawning behavior even appears to be contagious as you can see here. Reminds me of my students during one of my classroom lectures. Giant sea bass may also bark to communicate a warning to one another. Although it is audible underwater, my camera could not capture the sound. In the next episode, we will focus on the giant sea bass's mating behavior, scientific research, and conservation efforts by the state of California to ensure their continued presence in our giant kelp forests. Stay tuned!
It's time for munching. And mating. In the Macrocystis or Giant Kelp. With your host, Dr. Bill Bushing. One of the best things about my job is that when I go to the office, I don't have to wear a tie with my suit. Wetsuit, that is. In the last episode, we looked at the general characteristics, distribution, habitat preferences, and feeding behavior of the giant sea bass, Stereolepis gigas. Today we will look at their mating behavior, scientific studies, and efforts by the state of California to protect them following serious overfishing in the 19th and 20th centuries. The giant sea bass are often very active during their mating season. These bass appear to be agitated. Ha! Boys and their hormones. These interactions appear to be related to mate selection and pairing off. Some spawning aggregations have been observed for several decades. However, giant sea bass have never been observed mating in the wild. It is believed they may do so at dusk, when observations have ceased due to low light levels, and because most divers are now enjoying Miller time. However, mating has been observed in captivity. A single pair of giant sea bass have spawned in several years at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. This pair spawn nearly every week from June through August or September. Previously, state biologist John Fitch had examined giant sea bass gonads and determined that spawning occurred during the same time frame as with the captive bass. Spawning groups begin forming in May and may persist as late as early November at some sites. It is not known where most of these fish reside prior to forming these groups. Therefore, we have little data regarding how far they migrate to the spawning sites. It is believed, based on video taken by recreational divers, that most of the giant sea bass observed near Anacapa Island to the north are from one successful age class that recruited during the 1982-84 to 84 El Nino. Some scientists feel juvenile recruitment of giant sea bass in Southern California is only significant during such strong events. Individuals may show fidelity to the same spawning site year after year. It is believed that young fish learn the locations from older fish. If this learning process is broken, say by serious exploitation of the fish at a given site, it is not known whether the fish will return to these historic locations in the future. Based on my anecdotal observations, it appears that the bass formerly gathering in Lover's Cove off Catalina have moved further south along the coast. Little is known about where the fish go to once they disperse in the fall. At a few locations in Southern California, these fish may be found year-round. Female giant sea bass begin to mature sexually at 7 to 8 years, and all are believed to be reproductive at 11 to 13 years, when they are about 50 to 60 pounds. The male fish are thought to mature at about 40 pounds. Large females may produce many eggs. A 320-pound individual had ovaries weighing 47 pounds that contained an estimated 60 million eggs. The fertilized eggs are fairly large for a fish, measuring about 1.6 millimeters or 0.6 inches in diameter. The eggs float to the surface and hatch in 24 to 36 hours. Like many fish larvae, they drift and feed in the plankton for approximately 30 days 
before they settle to the bottom as tiny juveniles. It is believed that the giant sea bass doubles its population in about 10 to 14 years, a relatively long time due to the late age at which they reach sexual maturity. Although not based on a scientific study, I have repeatedly observed an interesting phenomenon. Most of my regular dive buddies are female if I'm not diving solo to film. On a number of occasions, my buddies and I have encountered courting pairs of these bass. On almost every occasion, the male would act aggressively towards me and defend his female while allowing a close approach by my female buddy. The female fish then allow me to approach very closely until the male returned or barked for her to rejoin him. It is my belief that these fish can detect the gender of humans perhaps due to sex pheromones we release into the water. This might make for a very interesting scientific study. Any Lady Go Diver volunteers out there? <laughs> Once pair formation occurs, the male spends much of his time tending the female. He is usually close by but may also watch her from a distance, as you see here. More than one male may try tending the same female, but males will usually chase competitors and drive them away from their mate once paired off. This courting pair was the first one I filmed right in Catalina Island's Casino Point Dive Park. The amorous couple seen here was filmed in nearby Lover's Cove. Unfortunately, the group there appears to have moved from that site, perhaps due to the continual presence of snorkelers and boat traffic. They now are found further down the coast in quieter waters past Pebbly Beach near Jewfish Point. This male appeared very perturbed by my presence. I don't want to get anthropomorphic here, but I think he was jealous to some degree. Ha! I don't blame him. Although she's not really my type. Male bass communicate with their female by barking a warning cry on occasion. Usually the female will leave and join the male to swim off. Male bass also tend their females by nudging their body to get them to move. Sometimes, these nudges are more than just a gentle love tap. This often results in a circling behavior by the pair, as seen in these sequences. These bass were seeking a little privacy to continue their courtship. One can hardly blame them. However, dive buddy Vicky and I intruded so we could try to film them while mating if possible. They slowly swam through the upper kelp force below the canopy and eventually found a small clearing where the male courted her by gently rubbing her body near the vent. However, due to our presence, they soon swam off to find a more private, trysting place away from our prying eyes and camera. The result of successful courtship is a baby sea bass that looks nothing like mom and pop. They were initially mistaken for a separate species. Hopefully, sightings of the young in our waters will become more common as the species recovers. At one point, these fish were aged by counting rings in their scales, a method later shown to produce highly inaccurate results. The more accurate method of using rings in the otoliths, bones in the fish's inner ear, is considered far more reliable. Recently, otolith studies by Dr. Michael Domeyer, then at the Flager Institute of Environmental Studies, estimated that giant sea bass are six years old 
when they reach a weight of 30 pounds. By age 10, they are about 100 pounds, and at age 15, reach 150 pounds. Unfortunately, in the past, commercially landed fish had their heads cut off, making it impossible to age them this way. The oldest fish aged was a 435-pound individual that was 75 years old. It is believed they may reach 90 to 100 years or more. This battered granddaddy must be nearly ready for Willard Scott to take notice. The International Game Fish Association recognizes the world record fish at nearly 7.5 feet and 563 pounds. It was caught off Anacapa Island in 1968. Angler and biologist Dr. Charles Frederick Holder, writing in his book The Channel Islands in 1910, claimed that the fish in the Gulf of California reached 800 pounds. Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Holder was appalled to see the take of giant sea bass and other fish using stout hand lines which gave the fish little fighting chance. In 1889, Holder and several friends formed the Tuna Club in Avalon to introduce more sporting methods of catching these and other fish using light tackle. The rules developed by the Tuna Club have been adopted by fishing clubs throughout the world and have helped make fishing a more sporting competition between the angler and the fish. The giant sea bass became a target for commercial fishers in 1870 and sport fishers in 1895. In 1910, Holder wrote that the giant sea bass was in need of protection around Catalina Island. He worked to get a marine reserve declared in 1913 that protected fish from commercial take in all waters within three miles of the island. This was later overturned due to political pressure from commercial fishers. Fishing for the bass continued into the 20s and 30s on up through the 1970s. The California Department of Fish and Game has kept data on commercial landings since 1916 and on recreational landings from 1936. The catch in Southern California waters peaked at 254,000 pounds in 1931. Three years later the total catch exceeded 861,000 pounds but nearly 94% of that was taken in Mexican waters. The catch there dropped below 200,000 pounds in 1964. During the 1970s, landings showed a steady decline from 129,000 to 38,000 pounds. By 1983, the catch was a mere 3,700 pounds. Recreational take peaked in 1963 in California waters. Trips were then arranged to take anglers down into Mexican waters to target spawning aggregations between Point Abrejos and Magdalena Bay along the Baja coast. These consistently caught between 70 and 100 giant sea bass. On one three-day trip, 255 fish were caught. Is it any wonder the fish soon disappeared in this region, with a catch peaking there in 1973? In 1981, a new law prohibited the take of giant sea bass for any reason. However, commercial fishermen could keep two fish per trip if accidentally caught in their nets. It also limited the number of fish caught in Mexican waters, but landed in California. In 1988, an amendment allowed only one fish as incidental take. Another law passed in 1993 banned the use of gill nets in inshore waters and undoubtedly reduced the incidental take of the sea bass. Anecdotal information suggests that the numbers of giant sea bass are beginning to rebound, but there is no hard scientific data yet to verify this. Due to the slow growth and reproduction of the species, the California population remains well below its historic levels. Encounters with them now are fairly common in the summer months, even in Catalina's Casino Point Dive Park. Interactions between divers and giant sea bass can last the entire duration of the dive if the individual remains calm and fairly still. However, 
Sudden movements and the flash from a camera may scare them off. Here it is obvious that the bass are observing us as much as we are observing them. There are still threats to the giant sea bass population in Southern California. A mild threat occurs when divers interact with these fish by attempting to touch them or by making abrupt movements. Too much of this unintended harassment may cause them to move away from traditional spawning areas and possibly disrupt mating. Although most spearfishers would never consider targeting a protected sea bass, there have been several sightings of bass with spears embedded in their sides or other evidence of possible spearing. Other wounds, scrapes, and scars I've observed probably resulted from rubbing against the reef rocks while feeding. Although law-abiding anglers do not target this protected species, they may be hooked or taken incidentally, especially when there are many fishing lines in the water as seen here. Fish that grow slowly and mature late are generally very sensitive to overfishing. Giant sea bass have a long generation time and are particularly vulnerable due to their limited distribution, large size, and habit of gathering to spawn. The population still remains well below the levels that would allow the reopening of the fishery, if ever. Although light fishing tackle generally doesn't cause great injury to these fish, trailing monofilament line may impede movement by becoming entangled. There is also the possibility of damage to other parts of the body when fish hooks break loose. Infection may also be a concern in these cases and there is a disease that affects the operculum. There are other dangers to the bass from human activity that have not been well addressed. Bottom sediments in Southern California may contain high concentrations of DDT and PCBs which can enter these fish due to their habit of feeding on bottom dwelling prey. Waters 200 miles south of the Mexican border are relatively free from these chemical toxins. These pollutants are known to interfere with reproduction and egg development in fish and other vertebrate species and therefore may pose problems for the giant sea bass's recovery. Relatively little is known about the biology, ecology, and behavior of the giant sea bass. There were no truly scientific studies conducted on this species during its early years of abundance. Even today, due to its protected status, there are relatively few scientific studies being conducted to improve our understanding of the giant sea bass and the best ways to protect it during its apparent recovery. Doctors Milton Love and Donna Schroeder at UCSB have modeled the effects of a catch-and-release fishery on giant sea bass populations. Their modeling of mortality indicates that small changes in the death rate can cause significant effects on the resulting population size and viability. Catch-and-release effects are especially pronounced in populations of long-lived fish like giant sea bass. In a scientific study of tagged bass off Anacapa Island, one in six tagged fish, or 16.5 percent, died from catch-and-release practices. Using a slightly higher catch-and-release mortality of 20 percent caused the hypothetical population to go extinct in just 16 years. Kathy DeWitt Olson and her husband Jim have observed giant sea bass off Anacapa Island in dives beginning in 1982. In May of 1997, they observed a group of 12 bass and began a monitoring program which includes 29 areas around Anacapa. In nearly 800 log dives as of 2005, they recorded more than 200 sightings. A region along the north shore of Anacapa Island has recently been designated as a no-take marine protected area, or MPA, due in part to this study of giant sea bass there. Beginning in the year 2000, 
scientists from the Flager Institute of Environmental Research also studied giant sea bass around Anacapa. They used conventional tags and acoustic tags with an array of several dozen receivers that recorded tagged fish approaching within 500 meters. Results as of 2005 show that about one-third of the fish at Anacapa leave the island completely in winter. The remaining fish move farther away from the island and into deeper water, possibly to feed on the squid spawning there. Through this research, these scientists hope to propose seasonal and or area closures and work to minimize the incidental take and associated mortality in giant sea bass populations so that they may continue to recover and expand their range, giving more divers an opportunity to experience these gentle giants.